A launching ceremony or the meeting of a secret society? A secret, certainly. This is the private language of the connoisseur. To some, art is sacred. To others, it's a commodity. And like all commodities, it has its marketplace, at once discreet and prosperous. It is here, above all, that the private language must be spoken and understood. This man is extremely interesting because uh, he's one of the small group of Cubist painters who have now become very rare and really too expensive for the average person to even consider. Mm -hmm. Can I see something? Yes, we, we'll show you, Mark, you see, who might just, I think Mr. Rowland's bringing one now. Mm -hmm. yes, I'm not sure about it. This is a man whose prices have gone up enormously in the last three or four years. Mm. We've got the one in front of us there. Yes. And I think, would you like to come out and see this other one we've got? Yes, it's one of the last ones we have. Right. Um, it came up to us about two months ago, and we've only just put it on show for the first time. This is very different from his earlier style of bands of color, isn't it? He was very influenced by Rocco, but Rocco empties out in his painting, whereas Heron has started to fill in. To become a painter in demand is a difficult journey, and it begins on foot. Yeah. Well, I think I'd have to, because I don't think you can tell a lot of pictures going to be like no, you see with your okay. furniture and uh, yes. high fitting so the rest of the world. have it on roof for two or three days and right. try it out, and then... Um, I, think I, I think I do, do. I think I'd like that it. one, yes. I think I that's the main try. Yes, frame. You can always have... And it's very much a nicer subject, I think, nicer to live with, don't you? Can I show someone some pictures? Yes, it would be nice if you Yes, I like that. I like that one very much. That one's too big. Yes, it's rather too big for the next exhibition, but you could bring back some more of that size later. I'd like to take it from you. Thank you very much. A canvas is catalogued and stored. Now it must wait for the miracle. Someone who will find it beautiful, or a good investment, or simply the right colour to go with the new curtains. A strange commodity which ends as a business transaction, but begins in some obscure moment of pain or exhilaration. To understand it, we study the lives of four people. Anthony Wishaw, age 28. Home, a Kensington studio. He shares it with his wife, who is a sculptress. He's already won a critic's prize, but is deeply suspicious of early success. There are great difficulties, I think, in, in maturing young. I think one of, the, one of the, the worst things that can happen is that one can mature and have a success. And because you have this success, you can rely on it and not, in fact, go on seeking into yourself and finding out new things. I think it's dreadfully important to go on experimenting always, always seeking all the time, you know, something much more than you've done already. And as soon as you stop that, you've had it. As soon as you get a, get a cliché and, and you cling on to it, you may make pots of money, but uh, I don't think you'll do very much as a painter. James Howey, age 28, Scottish. He now lives in the Portobello Road, London. His wife is a painter and they live and work over an antique shop. Howey has taken many jobs with one aim, 
to keep alive. The thought of a hand-to-mouth existence doesn't really worry me. It never has worried me. The important thing is that I must be able to paint. I'm often worried in my painting, but that has nothing to do with the existence that this is bringing about. I'm often irritated, very irritated, especially when I have to go and, and do things which are of no consequence to me, but are unfortunately necessary if I'm to get the wherewithal to go on painting. Sonia Lawson, age 25, born in Yorkshire. Both her parents are artists. She studied at the Royal College of Art and lives and works in a lodging house near Notting Hill Gate. Her attitude to life, like her surroundings, is decidedly unromantic. Well, all this business about um, the artist's life being romantic, I think it's nonsense myself. My, my life isn't very colourful, really. I think it's just hard work. I think people have read too many books on the life of Benvenuto Cellini or Toulouse-Lautrec or something. Alan Rawlinson, age 21, home, a Northfield housing estate. He lives with his parents and uses his back garden as a studio. Rawlinson is a silversmith. He works in Soho. It's a job which holds little satisfaction for him. As I went on and had new ideas, I began to get very dissatisfied with the work I was doing, reproducing antiques and sort of trash stuff. Uh, uh, so I felt I had to try and do something of my own. After hours, the workshop becomes his private studio. I used to work in the evenings making my sculpture. They gave me the key, you see, so I could go in Saturday, all day Saturday and sometimes even Sunday. I feel so stifled after working six years of an apprenticeship. And now I'm just beginning to get a little freedom. My next objective really is to get a studio to work so that I can be completely free. I can always go back to silversmithing if I need a job or if I need the money. This is one point they all have in common, a need for money or at least a job that will keep them alive without standing in the way of what matters most. James Howey solved the problem temporarily by working as a frame maker. If possible, the jobs which I would choose to do while trying to exist as a painter would be jobs in which I had to use my hands because I'm a great believer in craft. When I was making frames in London, I had by that time put some pictures into a gallery and I'd promised myself that as soon as the first one sold, I should then give up the job I was doing and paint for as long as the money from that would last. Another alternative is to teach. I don't think I would like to teach. I say that without ever having done it. But I feel that I should possibly be a little too impatient as a teacher. We sure does teach three evenings and one afternoon a week. Teaching itself is very difficult. Um, one can teach a certain amount. One can't teach vision very well because it's such a personal thing. I want very much to infuse people because I think it's very important. It depends a tremendous amount on the mood you are on the particular day of teaching, whether you're going to communicate anything with the students or not. And in a sense, one's got to give a tremendous amount. You've either got to give a lot or be bored or just go around and say rather mundane things. It's impossible, I think, to every day to be at a certain pitch of teaching in which you can really enthuse people or get them excited about what they're doing. And this depends on how one's own painting is going.
Like Wishaw, Sonia Lawson is also a part-time teacher. Once a week, she takes her students to the British Museum. I take my class to the museum because I think it's good for them to be able to draw three-dimensional solid things and pieces of sculpture are an exercise for them in this field. Actually, I enjoy teaching because you find students who you know have the right ideas and you find that all they need really is to be taught how to apply a medium. And I, I don't know, you get rather thrilled out of teaching them this and then seeing that they can express themselves once they've learnt this medium. But for her, the museum is not merely a workshop. It has its own private meaning for her. Myself, I'm able to look at the colossal head of King Amon, And I find the same serenity and monumental quality that I do in the Yorkshire landscape. The rocks and rock formations up there. There's a certain power in the northern landscape, I think, in color and in structure. One is at one with the elements somehow. One is conscious of a power behind nature. You're nothing up there, you're just a speck compared with the elements. You realize that nature is so strong that you're not able to put up any resistance against it. You just accept it. You're no longer afraid. I think this is the basis of my outlook and my painting. I haven't been afraid to experiment at all. I've lived here for most of my life. My parents are both artists. My mother paints from her imagination. My father is more traditional. Together they introduced me to art. Though when I was young, I didn't understand it. I've been able to appreciate it in my own time. But they gave me a basis to go on. The district itself has given me a sense of security. I don't think one has to search the wide world over to, to find inspiration or an ideal spot to paint. I think uh, the inspiration is in within oneself, really. It's uh, a spontaneous thing, or should be like handwriting or reading a book. Um, myself, I, I'm interested in all kinds of things and inspired by them, but uh, I don't wait around for inspiration. I feel it's uh, something that flows spontaneously, and I think I could paint anywhere. I like being with people and observing them. I don't paint them as they are. Rather, I pick and choose certain qualities which I see in a face or a head and later create something from them. But it all happens very spontaneously. particularly heads that are most like sculpture. There's something very sculptural about the line women shave around the chin. I like developing things in the abstract. With a picture of the bathers, I've attempted to suggest the insignificance of the figures, almost like fish enveloped in the various currents and depths of the water. And I wanted to express currents of the river running beneath Tower Bridge in a mural I painted for a cafeteria in a museum. To me, abstract painting is a free expression, but in no way a hazard. For me, it's always a controlled thing. I don't expect people necessarily to understand it because it's such a personal thing. 
My landlady, for instance, doesn't really understand what I'm doing, but she accepts it. She looks at it and says, well, I like this collar and that collar. And because she knows me, I suppose she trusts it. Probably if she saw it in a gallery, she wouldn't accept it. I'm going on discovering all the time. I, I haven't a haven that I want to arrive at. I, I'm quite content to go on adventuring. I don't think there is any conclusion to it, and I, I don't think there should be. I think it's an adventure and a continual discovery. The pub is just round the corner from where she lives. I go every Saturday night. I go not for company, more or less to relax and listen to the music and be detached. When I go into pubs, I find that half the people there are all sort of hiding behind some sort of mask. Underneath, they're very frightened. I don't know what they're frightened of exactly, but they're frightened. Wishaw's problem as a painter is to understand himself. I think painting is not so much a question of just looking at an object and putting it down. I think it's much more a question of trying to find one's own personality, trying to find out what it is that one really likes, and then having the struggle of trying to put that down. But it's not a mere copying process. It's linked also with um, this finding oneself and painting things that are, in a sense, important to you. Nearly all his work is dominated by the idea of tension. He works on large canvases, several at a time. Originally, he was occupied by tensions of their most swift and violent. finds tension in stillness. Bones suggest the framework on which action is hung. The museum absorbs him. Skeletons suggest the tension of which the flesh is capable. very much seeing people doing something which implies action. Perhaps most impressed by things that give me a sense of potential energy. Also I think of potential energy in the form of somebody just sitting down, or lying down, or leaning, or doing something which implies that they're capable of something else. The whole idea of weight or massiveness or Stonehenge-like quality, I like to find in this, this particular sort of subject.
very much like old heads. Visually, I find them most exciting, rather like rocks. And although it might come unconsciously into the painting, I feel that they, they've lived, they've suffered a lot. largest canvases, The Last Supper. I was trying very much to get a feeling of simplicity with the people, that they weren't any particular individual, but more a feeling of each one almost being a potential Judas, so that it's not so much a painting about individual saints or half-saints, but just people who would react under a similar situation, and I think they'd react now just as they did then. personal tensions. Repeatedly he examines his way of working, how to develop in the right direction and at the right speed. I can work solidly for about three days, four days, moving from picture to picture, and then I find myself completely exhausted and try as hard as I can. I cannot force myself to work, say, for another day, particularly if I work till four o'clock in the morning. The next day is more or less had it. There's nothing better I should like to do than to work, say, from eight to eight, rather than get the whims of my own emotion. My painting matures slowly. I think uh, the main reason for this is that, as a person, I mature uh, slowly. And have, in fact, spent about the first 25 years of my life just becoming a man and realizing or even realizing just a little bit what, what goes on in the world or, or what things are about. I think particularly with my, uh, speaking for myself that it's liable to be, you know, not till about 40 or 50 that I even paint a picture that's, you know, getting somewhere near anything. It's, uh, I find this, the most important problem for myself is just trying to find out what it is that is important to me. And this will go hand in hand, I think, with maturing as a person. For six years, Alan Rawlinson has tried to develop both as a professional silversmith and as an artist in his own right. His skill as a craftsman has given him confidence. In the first instance, my parents were not really sure about my work. They were not absolutely convinced that I was doing the right thing. But now they've come to the conclusion that I have got something worth doing and they support me wholeheartedly and they can appreciate to a certain extent what I'm doing. My neighbours may not appreciate exactly what I'm trying to do and they look at it and try and connect it with something around them such as spaceships, aeroplanes, and things of that sort of nature. But, as far as I'm concerned, if they appreciate it even a little in their own way, that's sufficient. It's a beginning, you see. They can go on from there. And if more modern art is brought in for the ordinary people so they can see much more of it, I think they will begin to like it, and it won't be quite so peculiar, and people won't laugh at it so much, and scorn it, if there's more of it.
knows security. He's also aware of the danger that goes with it, the danger of being a full-time silversmith and a part-time sculptor. He welcomes the fact that his job uproots him daily. I feel that if I had always stayed in a suburban district, I could never have really produced the same work as I'm doing now. Coming up to London and being in London, working here, really being involved in so much excitement and life and the masses of people and the movements and the whole atmosphere of London has inspired my sculpture. But London also means regularity, his worst enemy. You know, I don't like routine at all. All of a sudden I get a feeling that I want to do something different. How I like to work is really for a month probably, very hard every day, very long day, and then have a couple of weeks off, completely away from it. I've been disciplined for the last six years and it's become stifling, absolutely stifling now. I, I feel I can't really work and be happy working like that. For James Howey, London is a temporary workshop, the commercial centre of his world. It's a place not of people, but of things. Above all, the quality of light and the things which reflect it. Wishon Sonia Lawson, he often goes to a museum, but simply to admire fine craftsmanship. In the crowded streets, Howie feels alone, not as an outcast, but simply as someone utterly indifferent to the life and bustle around him. I found that in London, people couldn't care so much about what you do. They're not very interested. They're all going about their own business. They're not so interested in the fact you're an artist. They may think you're a trifle odd, but they, they don't interfere, uh, as they don't want you to interfere with them. I came here with a settled philosophy, and it would have to be something inside me which changed that philosophy. The place alone would not do that. Basically, I'm a very romantic person. That's why I like the North. London, for me, it's too cluttered up. Man-made things, cluttering up nature. Nature is the basic, the source of everything I do. The force of nature, the power of nature. His sense of community is strongest where there are fewest people. In the village of Ork Missy, which is his home, his feelings of isolation vanish. Is constantly.
things and places often seem clearer when you're away from them. By that time, things have assumed their correct perspective, they've sorted themselves out, become clearer. Back in London, he develops his ideas. In my painting, I'm trying to get something back. I'm not trying to spit anything out. I'm trying to put into a visible, tangible form something which is abstract, something which is a very strong feeling I work quite slowly and very steadily. I was trying to build up my picture. I was trying to get a bit more back. I wish to hell I could work quicker. I could say more in more things. Craft is the thing upon which good painting is built. This is brought out for me by the work of the old masters. Their craftsmanship was so good that they obviously could forget about it. I decided that the only real thing to do was to make my own materials. In that way, I knew exactly what they were, what were their limits. I could make things which were suited to the way in which I wanted to work, so that as little as possible stood between me and the feeling which I was trying to give to a painting. Howey's lived in London for a year. He's explored the world of galleries and sold some canvases. Now, he needs time and peace to work steadily. All that matters now is to accumulate enough paintings to fill the gallery when the time comes. This is a problem which confronts them all. Each of these four young artists has to meet the challenge of his first one-man show in London this year. private vision must be judged in public. The vision of a Scot who, in his own way, is trying to get something back from nature. The vision of a Northold boy, stifled by the routine of producing antiques. A young woman who doesn't think that there is any conclusion to painting and who is content to go on adventuring and discovering all the time. Of a man of 28 who may have to wait until he's 40 before one of his paintings satisfies him. For each of them, a private vision will become a number in a catalog. How much will it communicate? to the dealer, critic, casual visitor.